Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Investing from A to Z podcast. I'm your host, Steph Boldrini. This podcast is for everyone who wants to be part of our real estate family and learn commercial real estate investing from A to Z. I'll be sharing with you tips for real estate investing while being mentored by a few people with several years of experience so that you and I can make the least amount of mistakes as possible and succeed a lot faster. My goal is to keep things very straightforward because I value your time and you are here to learn. With that, in the last episode, I covered what I think is going to happen with the economy during this crisis and how that can impact commercial real estate prices in the next several months. And in this episode, we are also covering quite a few topics Related to the state of the industry, we are interviewing Deidre Woolard. She is a writer and editor for Million Acres with two decades of experience covering all aspects of real estate. And she comes from a long line of landlords, renovators, and contractors currently invested in properties from Massachusetts to California. Here we go. Deidre, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you joining very last minute (laughs) in order for the information to be very relevant to our listeners. Why don't we start with you sharing a little bit about you? Thank you, Steph. My name is Deidre Willard. I'm the editor of Million Acres, which is the real estate investing website from The Motley Fool, which is a finance company. For how long have you been covering real estate? I've actually been covering real estate for over a decade, and I've also worked in real estate brokerages. That means that you were there during the last downturn, and you're going to have some great insights for our listeners. What are you seeing in commercial real estate today? Well, I think there's a lot of things happening right now. Certainly the biggest impact is definitely being felt in in commercial across hospitality and retail right now with, with so many closures in different states. I mean, we're starting to open up in various areas, but it's all still very tentative. And one of the things I think that everyone is worried about is is a secondary outbreak and, and another round of closures. And what do you think is going to happen to the real estate market given your thoughts of where the shutdown is going and, and if we're going to have a second outbreak? I certainly think it's a it's challenging. Definitely certain sectors are being affected more than others and some sectors are benefiting a little bit. One of the things that we're seeing is industrial real estate is there's an ongoing need for last mile warehousing. And so industrial was the top performing sector last year, and it will probably be a relatively strong sector this year. Whereas hospitality and retail, you know, are being very heavily affected. The revenue per room in hotels is is at historic lows, and it, it'll, be a, it'll be a slow recovery for some of those sectors. You wrote a very good article recently. Do you mind sharing some of the bullet points on that article? So that was some research from our data researcher on Million Acres. It's available in our research center on millionacres.com. And what the writer did, Jeffrey Marino, is that he looked at retail employment by sector. And so seeing which markets are going to be at most risk because they have a high level of retail employment and therefore there could be a lot of unemployment, which could therefore then lead to people not making rent, drops in housing prices, people needing to leave the area and go somewhere else for jobs. One of the things that we're seeing about this crisis that's a little bit different than the last recession is just that sort of ripple effect that's happening. So, you know, people can't make rent and then landlords are having trouble making their payments and then it sort of goes outward from there. And how bad do you think it will get? Well, I think it it really is going to depend on this reopen and how how slow it is, how much things really change. And of course, the vaccine. I mean, I think one of the things that that everyone is talking about right now is 
if there is a possibility of a vaccine, or I've also heard of immunity certificates, but that's also uh, certainly risky because we wouldn't know necessarily if immunity is total. Exactly. That's what I've been reading as well. Even though you might have overcome the virus at some point, it doesn't mean that you will be immune to it at a later time. If you had unlimited funds to invest today, when do you think you would deploy that and in which asset classes would you focus on? Well, I think one of the interesting things is that everyone is watching the residential real estate market and looking for prices to drop. And it doesn't seem like that's going to happen anytime soon because uh, demand, supply and demand are essentially you know, pretty well matched right now. So one of the sectors that we've been looking at over on Million Acres is multifamily real estate investment trusts, for example. And multifamily was already predicted to have a pretty strong this year this year. There's obviously, there's a lot of demographics that support multifamily continuing to grow. Household formation is on the rise. And so I feel like multifamily is still going to be strong, especially in those markets where you have a lot of tech employment. So places like Seattle, Charlotte is a good example. The southern states have really seen a lot of people moving in. And so you, when you have that high population, those are good spots for multifamily. So you would invest in industrial and multifamily, is that yes, absolutely. fair to say? Yeah. Okay. In the tech hubs. Definitely looking at the tech hubs, looking at where people are moving to, looking at where there is a, a younger population. Okay. What do you think will happen to the retail sector? I think retail is an interesting sector because there's different parts of retail that will be strong and different parts that will suffer more. So one of the things that's happening right now is Simon Property Group is reopening up some of their malls. And so as they're doing this, they're starting to put different rules in place in terms of how many people you can have in the mall or in an individual store and having uh, hand sanitizers available and things like that. So one of the things that we're watching right now with retail is what does the new retail look like? How much foot traffic can you have in a store and how much... And how much foot traffic do you need in order to pay your rent? One of the things that's been certainly very interesting over the past month is to see how many of these bigger retailers stopped paying rent or partially paying rent. Cheesecake Factory stopped paying rent in April. I know The Gap had stopped paying rent. So the large malls are definitely having difficulty. But one of the things we're also looking at is smaller retail, so single store, like strip mall type of locations, those are actually still doing fairly well. I mean, you have some things like gyms, which are closed, but we're also seeing stores like 7-Eleven, CVS, Walgreens, those have actually benefited during this crisis. So those are strong places for leases. And if tenants are not paying rent, that will definitely <laughs> hurt a ton of landlords who will therefore potentially go into foreclosure because they cannot pay their mortgage. Well, one of the factors there too is uh, if they can get a PPP or an EDIL loan. So there was the first round of funds that came out from the CARES Act and a lot of people applied for it. You've probably seen some of those articles about loan shaming when some of the the bigger retailers or bigger restaurant chains took a loan and then had to give it back. So there's a little loan shaming going on, but for the smaller smaller sort of mom and pop retail, those loans are, are a lifeline right now and are actually helping some of these stores stay afloat. Yeah, I don't know much about these loans and how long they will be able to help these stores survive. Let's hope uh, they will be able to survive for the long run, but I'm I'm just a bit concerned for these mom and pop stores for sure. Yeah, it's definitely harder for the smaller for the smaller landlords, and one of the things that we're seeing with larger uh, larger retail locations is that some large companies are also using their real estate as collateral. Uh, an example of that is Macy's. Is that uh, in getting loans, they can use the value of their real estate. So Macy's owns real estate. Macy's actually owns a lot of real estate including their giant flagship Herald Square uh, location in New York. Oh, okay. That's yeah. awesome. Let's move 
to REITs, real estate investment trusts? Do you have any thoughts of what is going to happen to them? It has been a wild ride for real estate investment trusts over the past month or two with the stock market. So one thing that usually happens in a downturn stock market is that the real estate investment trusts tend not to take as big a hit just because real estate tends to be a more stable and slow moving part of the stock market, whereas something like tech tends to go up really high and then down. But mm -hmm. this time, because a lot of those a lot of those real estate investment trusts are tied to places that have, have been closed. Those real estate investment trusts have also been hit. So Simon Property Group, which is the mall retailer I mentioned earlier, or uh, some of the ones that are tied to restaurant chains, things like that, they've been really impacted by this. And so it's been a much slower journey for them. So when I look at REITs, I'm looking at what types of REITs are best protected. So Prologis, which is uh, the largest warehousing REIT, that's one that we're looking at. We look at ones that are doing data centers. So right now we're all using so much data. We're all at home. We're all on Zoom. And so data center REITs are real estate investment trusts that invest in those data centers that basically house all our data and those giant computers that keep all of this all of this zooming running. So those are a good good thing to look at as well. And the ones that don't have these asset classes and their investors are pulling out, they have to sell their real estate in order to give the cash back to the investors, right? So what happens then? I think that is a concern for the hospitality REITs because they don't have any income coming in. And so that may be a concern are we going to see some hotels close? Possibly. I think one of the things that is really sort of uncertain right now is how much is behavior changing? So we've all changed our behavior temporarily, but are we going to be changing our behavior permanently? So, mm -hmm. and a lot of that comes back to that idea of, of a vaccine and how, how comfortable and safe we feel, even with something like Airbnb. So will people feel safe staying in people's houses? Will there need to be a, a day off in between guests or something like that to keep people safe and to sort of make people feel more secure? Because a lot of this is about psychology and how we feel about the places that we go. So do we, will we feel safe in a movie theater with, you know, hundreds of people? Will we feel safe at sporting events? And so all of that connects back to the real estate. Exactly. Well, very interesting. It seems like uh, a lot will be to be determined. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to be determined, but there's also, I think one of the things that's important is to just keep an eye on the unemployment numbers, keep an eye on the jobs that are being created. I feel like this is also an opportunity in the real estate industry is one of the things that we're seeing is how, how much real estate agents have increase their use of technology and increase their ability to uh, to do things virtually, whether it's virtual tours or using drones or doing document signing online. One of the things that has come out of this is that there's a lot more remote online notarization. Before all this happened, it, you could only do remote online notarization in about 23 states. And now more states have temporarily allowed it and may allow it permanently. So the good thing about this is that we're seeing it, it's pushing real estate in a way to be more technologically adept and finding out what we really can do without needing to be together in the same space. That is a very good point. Uh, real estate has always been a, a lagger in the technology <laughs> world. A lot of so. paperwork. And I think one of the things we're learning is that we don't have to have all that paperwork. Very true. Exactly. Is there anything else that you think is important that our audience should know? Well, another sector that we're looking at that I find really fascinating is office space and co-working. And so there's a lot of debate right now about what the future of work looks like and if co-working will continue to be popular and if so, what shape it will take. And one of the things that is being debated is whether or not you will need to have more space or less space per person. Because in the past few years, the amount of space per person in an office has 
gradually gotten smaller and smaller, partly due to this open floor plan offices. But now, if we need to have social distancing, whether it's temporary or more permanent, and you have to have six feet of space in between, you could actually see companies need to take on more space because they'll need to put in that type of, you know, that type of spacing inside an office. So we may actually see some companies needing to reconfigure their spaces. And another question that I have there too is with regard to remote work. Certainly a lot of companies have let their employees work remotely now. And so even the ones that were resistant to it in the past. So we may see some companies doing some sort of staggered situation where certain people come in one day and don't come in another day or just more flexibility. So that may change the office landscape as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, a friend of mine that works at Apple says that that's exactly what they will do. One day, one group can come in. The other day, the other group will be able to come in. So that'll be interesting to see if it will either have companies rent less or more, as you said. And I have no idea what will happen. I think it will definitely depend on the company. And I think some of this is absolutely temporary and some of this may be more permanent. One of the things I think about is the types of things that happened after 9-11 and how the country sort of changed and we, we felt unsafe in certain areas. There were certain behavioral changes that shifted from six months, maybe a year, and then gradually things sort of got back to normal. And I suspect, depending on how long this particular crisis goes and whether or not there is a secondary outbreak in six months, I think that some behaviors will will change permanently and some will sort of change temporarily and then gradually we'll go back to the way we were. I agree with you there too. Thank you so much, Deidre. That was very useful. I really appreciate you spending the time with us today. Thank you. I love talking about this stuff. As always, Deidre's information will be under show notes and make sure to join our Facebook group to continue the conversation at facebook.com slash groups slash Monte Carlo REI. This link is also under show notes and I will see you next time.